drug habits some say they just can't be mothers and robbers no place seems to be safe but you'll be my protection every step of the way and i want to say thank you lord for all you've done for me oh, oh, oh. thank you we can't sing it all but we give you thanks and we give you praise because you have been so good to us we ask God that now as we continue into the ministry of the word that you will anoint our ears to hear what the spirit is speaking to the church anoint our lips to proclaim your truth with clarity and anoint our hearts to be receptive to not be rebellious to not be apathetic, to not be indifferent, but to embrace what you're speaking into our lives. We know you love us and we long for your direction. Make us doers of your word and not hearers only is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for our praise team and thankful for the opportunity that we have from week to week to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. I hope everyone had a good uh, Thanksgiving holiday, uh, Thanksgiving day, and um, I hope your team won. <laughs> my, my team got trounced. <laughs> In fact, somebody told them that they were the Thanksgiving turkey. That's what they did. 
But, um, but anyway, we had a lot of fun last Sunday celebrating our team spirits. So I hope you're not too bereaved today because of <laughs> what happened to your team. If your team, well, the victors were valiant, but uh, we'll see um, how we continue as winners as people claiming victory in the name of the Lord. Today, we're going to talk about Miriam. Um, And we've been focusing on the theme of worship. Worship the Lord with prayer, with offerings, with song and dance. And uh, last week, we spoke about Moses' song of victory from this same chapter, Exodus chapter 15. Um, and Moses' song had a lot of verses to it. And we uh, spoke about the song of victory. But today, I want to look at Miriam's song, because Miriam's song is more like a chorus. It's less like a hymn or an anthem. It's like a chorus. And um, the, the word says that Miriam sang the refrain back to them, sing to the Lord for an overflowing victory, horse and rider he threw into the sea. If I had a sub topic for Miriam's song, it would be Miriam's prophetic ministry. Miriam was a prophet. And if we look carefully at her story, at her role in the Exodus, we will find that even though the the main focus is Moses and Moses is the lawgiver. Moses is uh, the one who led the people uh, into freedom. Moses is the great prophet. But Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, all three of them had prophetic ministry. And Miriam's prophetic ministry is a little different. But I, be- I want to show you some things, even in just these couple of verses before us, about Miriam's prophetic ministry that I trust will be an inspiration to us as we continue to do the ministry of worship, as we continue to do prophetic ministry in our own time and space. The prophetic ministry of Miriam actually begins at the beginning of Exodus, you'll recall that Miriam was the girl whose baby brother was hidden in the bulrushes by his mother. Um, Because the word had gone out, kill all the baby boys, he survived being born. His mother hid him, and his sister had the assignment of watching over him. Pharaoh's daughter had him rescued from the water. And then when Pharaoh's daughter said, oh, I want to adopt this child. Who will take care of, who will nurse the child for me? The little girl spoke up and said, oh, I know someone who can do it, and went and got her mother. And so Miriam's prophetic ministry Uh, or at least, uh, let's not call it prophetic ministry, let's call it this. Her role in the story of deliverance began when she was a child just doing what she had been asked to do. And because of her intervention, Moses was nursed by his own mother in Pharaoh's palace. Okay? Don't miss that. So Miriam is there from the beginning. If there's no Miriam, there's no Moses. Moses might have drowned, or Moses might have been totally lost in the palace of Pharaoh because he didn't have any connection with his own people if it had not been for Miriam. So Miriam has a role in this. She doesn't just show up when they cross the Red Sea, but she has a role from the very beginning uh, in uh, and so those three siblings, I'll say a little bit more about those three siblings, very important, two brothers and a sister, and they all have an anointing from God. So in Miriam's case, what we see her doing, once they have crossed over in the Red Sea and they've crossed over into freedom and Pharaoh's army is done in, overwhelmed, drowned, destroyed, 
Miriam raises, now this is my word. Don't get upset by what I'm saying. Miriam raises a curse praise. A curse praise. That's not in the Bible. It's just what I'm displaying to you what it is. Now, a curse prayer, we see them sometimes. Um, the, uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Horace Shepherd preached this at the celebration for uh, the Celebration Church uh, 50th. Um, uh, he said he, his sermon was Curse the Mockery. And he spoke about Elisha. And when the children were mocking Elisha, <laughs> the, Elisha spoke a curse prayer, and the bears came after him. And mauled, they got mauled by bears. That's a curse prayer. And, and we read about curse prayers sometimes in the Bible where people particularly pray for the Lord to take somebody out. And that's what happens. Now, I'm not advising you to pray those kind of prayers. You just need to be aware of them. Okay? But the curse praise is, look what God has done. The people who, they were coming after us. They were bearing down on us. They changed their mind. See, Pharaoh has said, okay, let the people go. And then Pharaoh changed his mind. No, we need to get them back here to finish doing this work. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord got a victory over Pharaoh. So when I say curse praise, I don't mean praise that has curse words in it. What I mean is how you celebrate what the Lord has done when it's mixed with tragedy and harm. Okay, so it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. But she took the tambourine and I don't know if they had blues in the Bible, but she might have been singing. You know, sometimes you, sometimes in our uh, repertoire of music, sometimes we sing little blues, some because life is not always the tonality of happy music. I love the tonality of I love upbeat. But, you know, every now and then you got to sing a song with a blue note in it. And so, because life is not all fun and laughing. I mean, sometimes, you have to cry sometimes. And one of the things that we get in this story, they're celebrating. Now, in Egypt, there's mourning because of all these people who have been lost. But this was the Lord's doing. So when I say the curse praise, they're praising God, but the consequences of the curse come from God. God did away with them. God made a way for the Israelites to cross over on dry ground into freedom. They had suffered and suffered and suffered. And God said, okay, your suffering is over. And then when the enemy came after them, God destroyed the enemy. So every now and then, it, 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 it doesn't give you permission to take it into your own hands. But there's nothing wrong with opening your eyes, because this is, to me, the beginning of prophetic ministry is what you see. And Miriam saw all those horses and chariots and she was like you better sing unto the Lord because the Lord the horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea that was her song that was her song and so it was based on what she saw because it was almost look, try this it's almost as if they, they crossed over and, you know, very soon they was complaining. They said, oh, we didn't know it was going to be like this because where's the food and where's the water? And how, whose idea was this for us to be free? But with, you read on about two verses, and they're complaining, right? But on the moment when they're set free, there's a prophetic interpretation of what just happened to us. Because there are some people 
who God can do every miracle in the book, and they just keep moving like, oh, really? Oh, hmm. Let's just keep moving. They don't stop. They don't notice. They don't get it. And so Mary was like, okay, let's take a praise break because God has delivered us. And so what you have here is what in the African-American tradition we would call call and response. And call and response means it, it, it's a way of singing. You have one, a singer that sings a line, and then the group responds. Um, it happens with preaching. Uh, the preacher says something, and the people respond. We don't do a lot of this at Third Street, but black church does this in general. Preacher says something, is it's a, help, uh, can I get a witness? And then somebody got to say something, okay? Um, but I know we're real quiet here. Uh, we, we, you know, you, can, you don't have to always speak back. You can feel back. Dr. Evans Crawford used to say this. So just feel back, speak back. But there's call and response. So it's not just one person speaking, but there's a conversation. And the conversation can be uh, what we call antiphonal singing, where one soloist or one section or the men or the women is singing and responsively to each other. So that's really what we have here. So Miriam's, Miriam sang, but depends, if you look at that uh, 20th verse, that 21st verse, uh, she's really not just singing. She's saying, she's getting an answer, getting a response from Moses. She's saying, sing to the Lord. It's not just a song. But just imagine if they, they're standing there, they're bone dry, the Pharaoh's army is drowned, and she's saying, now I know y'all not just going to keep on moving and not just take a moment to do a praise break and sing a song to the Lord. So she's saying to Moses, sing to the Lord. And look at Moses' song. What's how Moses' song begins. I will sing to you. Yeah, you better sing to the Lord because she told you that's what you're supposed to do. Before we march on, let's sing to the Lord. That's call and response, call and response. And so that's part of her prophetic ministry is to get the people to respond to what the Lord has done. And can I just say, whenever we worship, whenever we preach, whenever we lead worship, whenever we pray publicly, that's what we're trying to get people to do. Not just look at me, but let's respond to what God has done. Let's respond to the presence of the Lord. Let's respond to the goodness of the Lord. That's what we're trying to get people to do. But everybody, everybody's not seeing what, you, seeing what you see. Everybody's not understanding what you understand. So Miriam saw it. And so she's like, y'all better sing to the Lord. Because look at what the Lord has done. Micah, the prophet Micah, verse 6. I hope you're familiar with Micah 6 and 8. What does the Lord require of us to do justice, love mercy, while comely with thy God? That's Micah 6 and 8. But Micah 6 and 4, verse 4 says, For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So that's a summary of the prophetic ministry of these three siblings. And so anytime somebody tells you that women can't preach, that women can't be prophets, that the Bible say women should keep silent, point them to this verse. Moses God said, I sent them. God didn't say, I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam just tagged along. It says, I sent before you. In other words, in order to bring you up out of Egypt, sometimes you got to send somebody to go get them. 
You know, we sometimes people, when you're suffering and you're in a bad spot, but you're so decrepit that you can't even rescue your own self. So God got to send somebody to go get you. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, bring you up out of the land of Egypt to redeem you from the house of bondage. Redeem, redeem doesn't just mean escape. Okay, you got to escape. But once you escape, you got to become free. It's a difference. It's one thing to run away. It's another thing to own your freedom. And it took them 40 years, didn't it? It took them 40 because they weren't ready to be free. Now, they were ready to be rescued. But to be ready to be free is another thing. That's why they needed. See, Moses had to help. God told Moses, Tell Pharaoh, let my people go so they can serve me on this mountain. It's like, it's not just let them go, but show them what they're supposed to do after they're free. And so God said, I sent Moses, Aaron, Miriam. And each one of them had a distinctive ministry of leadership to help the people of God make the transition from bondage into freedom And to promise, God's redemptive action includes bringing the people up. And Miriam's action, she sings the song that God had put in her mouth. And and she calls on Israel to sing. So God speaks through her and through now watch this. I wish I had a tambourine. We don't have no tambourine around here. Um, but a tambourine. God speaks through the prophetic percussion of her tambourine and the prophetic message of her dance. Because the Bible says that Miriam took a tambourine in her hand. And where she get it from? Might have stolen it from the Egyptians. I don't know. But she had a tam- a timbrel. That's a tambourine. Y'all know what a tambourine is. And so she took it in her hand. And then all the women followed her playing tambourines and dancing. So she led them in a certain kind of praise, okay, with the tambourine and the dance. But the tambourine had a prophetic message. Okay, y'all think I really lost it now, right? And say the tambourine had prophetic message. Let me show you something else. First Chronicles chapter 25. David and the commanders of the army selected for service some of the sons of Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with liars, harps, and cymbals. Uh, Verse 4, they prophesied with the lyre and thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. God gave Heman 14 sons and three daughters. Verse 6, all of these, okay, you got 17 children, all right? 14 sons, three daughters. Look, watch this, verse 6, 1 Chronicles 25. All these were under the direction of their father to sing in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres for the service of the house of God. God gave him all those children. He made them learn music. It says, under the direction of their father for the service and made them go to church. Made them. Taught them. Trained them. And so, look at verse 7. The number with all the people, I'm not going to read all the names of all the people because there wasn't just one family. There was a bunch of families where the, the children and the parents were musicians. And their number with their relatives, verse 7, who were trained in singing to the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. So David had a 288-person praise team. 288. That's not a whole lot, is it? But guess what? 
They prophesied with their instruments. So they didn't just play. They were skilled. They were trained, but they were inspired by God. So the voice of their instrument was the voice of God. And I'm showing you this because I want you to see that prophetic ministry is a message, but God has all kinds of ways of sending the message. We just can't be boneheaded about it. We have to recognize prophecy, prophetic ministry, the message of God is not always just what is preached. It's what it's, there's a song that has a message from God. There's a percussion, there's a horn, there's a keyboard that is messaging for God when the musician is skilled. That means practice and praise. Okay? Because this, this First Chronicles 25 emphasizes they were under direction. It, it doesn't just mean that somebody had a baton, but it means there was some discipline. There was some discipline. They didn't just up and, no, they, there was some planning. There was some training. There was some skill. There were some standards of performance. But it was all about prophesying. That was the purpose. If you know that God is speaking through you, you don't want to play around. You want to do your best to be the best steward of the message that God is communicating through your song or through your instrument or through your words. Miriam's assignment included a call to celebration of liberation, to singing and dancing, a soundtrack for the rite of passage from bondage into freedom. And she led the women, and she challenged, let's say, Okay, the Bible says the women follow her. She's dancing and she's playing the tambourine. The women follow her. But if you, if you buy my interpretation, she's challenging Moses and all of the people, including the men, to this transformational worship experience. She wasn't just leading the women. She was challenging everybody to praise the Lord. Um, last week when I, I spoke about Moses' song, I referenced the uh, work of Gerald Jansen, is a, a biblical scholar who's done a very careful uh, study of this passage. And I, I won't trouble you with all the, the particles and the syntax and the Hebrew. But he says the women's celebration of the Lord's triumph is what gives Israel's eyes their discernment. So that seeing the Egyptians dead on the seashore, the people see this as the great work which the Lord did. And they fear the Lord, and they believe the Lord, and they believe in his servant Moses. So her song and her exhortation helped the people to see, you know, this is what the Lord has done. They didn't just accidentally drown. They didn't just slip and fall into the water. This is what the Lord has done. That's what the... Pro Prophetic vision helps you to see. Look at what the Lord has done. And that's what Miriam's role is. People, she was called by God to use her tambourine to proclaim a prophetic word of victory for God. She was called to summon Moses to sing a song to the Lord. And she was called to lead the women in praise, including the dancers, because they, they have, you have the tambourine, you might as well dance. Now, all of our music is not danceable. As I was saying, sometimes you sing the blues, and sometimes you sing a song that just doesn't have a dance beat to it. We don't have to sing all the same song all the time. Can you see that there is, at least implicit in this story, a broad worship repertoire. 
And see, what happens, we do all or nothing. It's like, okay, I like hymns. I don't want to hear anything else but hymns. Okay. And then other people, oh, I can't stand hymns. I don't want to hear any hymns. Well, it's good that there's some music that is performed that you don't like. That's a good thing because that means that there's diversity. And don't get mad. Well, I don't like that song. So, no, no, it's, it's a diversity. And so part of our experience as a worshiping community is to cultivate an appreciation of a broad repertoire of music because God uses all kinds of music to send all kinds of messages, if you will allow it. So the last thing you want to do is shut down the music that God wants to use to minister to people. You don't want to shut that down. Mm, Y'all get real quiet on me now. Don't shut it down. Now, you have to have some standards. I, I already said that. You have to have some standards. You have to have some qualifications. You have to have <clears throat> some auditions. <clears throat> You don't just put anybody up to, but, but you should have some diversity because every now and then you got to sing a new song to the Lord. And if it's new and it's different, don't just reject it because it's new and it's different. It might be the Lord giving you a, a message that is going to get somebody's attention who is tone deaf to every other song you've sung. Miriam is the prophet, and literally is saying, because it names her as a prophet in this text, right? She's the inspired one. That means that she is filled with the Spirit. We have to wait till Acts chapter 2 for people to be filled with the Spirit, okay? This is Exodus, and they feel, she's filled with the Spirit. The song comes from the Spirit of God. The rhythm of the tambourine and the dance comes from the Spirit of God who inspires praise and instills victory in her worship. People won't always listen to a sermon. Sometimes they will sleep through it. Sometimes they'll do like my students do. I learned this when I was an undergraduate. If you're really not paying attention but you want to stay awake, just stare at the professor. And it'll look like you're paying attention. Uh, we have all kinds of creative ways of tuning out sermons and all kinds of reasons for it. If you don't believe me, go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. Even when the Lord calls people into he says, they're not going to listen. So the Lord gives you advance notes. Don't get your feelings hurt if they don't listen, because that's what people do. They won't always listen to a sermon, but you preach anyhow. You keep on preaching. But you know what people will listen to? A song. And I tell you all, all the time, maybe one of these days you're going to believe me. You go into a worship service, don't sleep on the song because the song might be the best preaching you're going to get. Don't sleep on it. Don't sleep on a, a reading of scripture. Don't just stand up there and read the scripture. We read the scripture as if that's all the people are going to get. Because you don't know what you're going to get in the sermon. They will listen to a song. So the Lord didn't say, okay, Miriam, line them up and preach a sermon. No, the Lord didn't say that. The Lord said, take your tambourine. And, and, and I'm going to put some dance. And they're going to listen to that. At least going to give them something to look at. And lead them. The people singing and fearing the Lord and believing, it didn't automatically happen. But as that event was celebrated in Miriam's tambourine and dance, they got it. It's like, oh, this is what the Lord has done for us. Now, Miriam doesn't do a whole lot of preaching. And when she does speak, it's a little bit problematic. I'll just briefly bring to your attention. You can read this more carefully. I encourage you to do Read Numbers chapter 12. Uh, you can read about what happened when Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses for marrying a Cushite. Do you know who the Cushites are? The Cushites are the black people. 
So he had a black wife. And Miriam and Aaron had something to say about it. These are siblings now, siblings. Uh, when the Lord heard it, because the Lord hears everything you say. In fact, the Lord knows everything you think, even if you don't say it. But they evidently had some conversation about, well, he married that woman, and whatever they thought about that woman he married. And, well, who says God doesn't speak through us? So there was this sibling rivalry competition, and they were questioning who is speaking for God among the three of them. When the Lord heard it, the Lord was displeased. And the Lord said, Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, when there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. In other words, I show the prophet something. That's, you can't be a prophet if you don't hear from God and if you don't see what God is showing you. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And then it went down. The same, I told you, Miriam led the cursed praise. Miriam looked, and she was plagued with leprosy. And the Lord, can I just say the Lord got a sense of humor? Okay, you're going to talk about the black white? Look what color you are. The Bible says she was white. When she got the leprosy, her skin turned white. Y'all don't think that's funny, do you? And Moses prayed for her. Moses said, oh, please, Lord, please. I know they're my brother and my sister, but please, Lord. And the Lord, she had to go outside the camp for seven days, and she was healed. Um, so what I'm saying is the, the prophet is not perfect, and sometimes the prophet misspeaks. But when you're doing prophetic ministry, you better beware that you're not the only one God has called. And she got that lesson the hard way. Now, I, I will close with this. I have a, a final word from Jansen, from Gerald Jansen. The girl who was instrumental and Moses rescued from the waters of the Nile. Now, instrumentally and vocally leads Moses and Israel in the celebration of their rescue through the waters of the sea. And like the women who served as midwives at the birth of Hebrew children in Egypt, remember there were two midwives. Pharaoh told them, if the baby is a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let the girl live. The midwives refused. They said, we fear God. They refused to kill the boys, but they were under orders to kill the boys. But the midwives didn't. They said, oh, by the time we get there, the baby's already born. And, but they refused to do what Pharaoh had told them to do. Um, and so like those midwives, she and her sisters bring to birth Israel's new exodus-centered hymnody. In other words, there's a whole new repertoire, and we read it through the Psalms. We read it through the books of prophecy. There's a whole new set of songs, a whole new tradition of praise, a whole new tradition of worship that is the song of deliverance. And that genre is born when Miriam picks up her tambourine and challenges Moses to sing a song to the Lord. Now, Miriam and Aaron then, are the first leaders in Israel's celebration of Exodus. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into it, but Aaron, I've mentioned this before. When Moses went to the mountain, Aaron allowed the people to melt down, told the people to melt down their gold, and they worshipped this golden calf. They were celebrating, but it turned into idolatry. That's why you have to have some standards, some spiritual and moral standards that you bring to worship or else the worship is going to go off the rails. 
especially if it got dance in it. So they were dancing up a storm. And so it, it was good that they were worshiping, but their worship got off under Aaron. So what happened was Aaron then becomes an example of how worship can take us into idolatry and apostasy where we're worshiping the wrong thing. You always need to bring worship back to God. If you can't, if it, if it goes out there, it needs to all, you bring it back to God. And so Aaron is the example of how our worship can drift away from God. So we're celebrating something else. And then Miriam represents the worship of the God of the Exodus, the prophetic worship, the worship that says, okay, y'all, we got to stop right here and celebrate what God has shown us, what we're seeing. We need to celebrate what God has spoken, and we need to sing a new song. That's Miriam's prophetic ministry. And I believe that that ministry inspires us and encourages us to be creative, to be expressive in our worship, but don't lose sight of who we're worshiping and why. God has blessed us. God has brought you up. God has rescued you. But as you go forward, we need to see what God is showing. We need to speak the word that God has spoken to us. And we need to sing the song. The song of praise. The song of victory. Got to sing the blues sometimes. As long as it, blues is fine as long as it's true. Blues is all right. Sometimes you got to put that blue note in there because that's the reality check. But don't, but see that. It can, go, it can go off the rails, too, and then you just get into a funk of depression. Okay? So we just, that's why the Lord gives us some. We, you don't always come to worship with the same mood or the same mindset, but it gives us a way of recognizing God is present with us. God is speaking to us. God is moving among us when we're happy and when we're sad. Jesus is all the world to me. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Sometimes you need a song like that. It's not all tambourining and jumping. Sometimes you need a quiet song for the quiet moments. But sometimes you need to pull out all the stops and let everybody know, mighty God we serve. Miriam is teaching us still. Let's learn and let's be inspired by her example. God, we thank you for the prophetic ministry of so many wonderful people in the scriptures. They weren't perfect. They had all the same kind of struggles and competitions and insecurities that we do. But we thank you, God, that Miriam came to voice at the moment of triumph. Thank you for her example. Thank you for her courage and her boldness. Help us, God, to be bold and courageous as we worship you. Sometimes we have to worship you in spite of, in spite of our circumstances, in spite of how we feel. But thank you, God, for giving us a repertoire of praise, a repertoire of reflection, a repertoire of confession, and a repertoire of victory. Help us, God, in our worship to encourage you, as the scripture says, to inhabit the praise of your people. Give us the victory. Give us the healing. Give us the empowerment and the grace as you minister through your messengers, instruments, through the singers, through the vocalists, through the praise team, through the drums, through the keyboards. Minister your word and your truth to our lives. Inspire us to your purpose, God. And help us to be faithful and creative and bold in our praise is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
I wish I had the soundtrack to go with this message. Maybe I'll do that next time I preach it. But I want to encourage you um, as you continue in your worship, as you listen to your music this week, as you uh, watch your whatever you watch online, the, uh, different services, I want you to be attentive to how God is speaking to us in our songs, in our worship, in our instruments. And we want to take this message to the world. There's none of this that I spoke about happened in church. It happened in the open air where all could see. And I think we need to take some more steps to get our worship, get our praise. It's good to praise God in here, but it's good also to praise God where other people who otherwise wouldn't come to your church can see, mm, wonder what they're singing about. Who is this God that they're celebrating? And so let's do what we can to expand the impact of the gifts and the message and the ministry God has given us. Let us receive the benediction now to God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, the blessings of God for the people of God. Amen. Come on, come on, come on.